Welcome to the Got Invention Show. I'm your host, Brian Freed, and our guest is the creator of Pillow Pets. Her name is Jennifer Telfler. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. So, wow, look at that. Look at that display behind you. Unbelievable. Let me take a quick look at that. Yeah, we've made Whoa. a lot of pillow pets throughout the years. <laughs> Those are all yours. Unbelievable. Yeah. So, Jennifer, why don't you start off by telling us who you are, where you're from, and how you came up with the pillow pets idea? So, hi, my name's Jennifer Telfer. I'm from Orange County, California. Um, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. My grandfather, my father, and two out of my three siblings are all entrepreneurs. Um, my oldest son, he's around six or seven. Uh, he had a stuffed animal that he always liked to sleep with and he ended up flattening it out. And that's when I came up with the concept like, well, can we make stuffed animals actually functional, not just something you throw in the corner of a bedroom? <laughs> Very interesting. So he was using his regular stuffed animal as a pillow, flattened it out after a while. And all of a sudden you're like, you know what? That could be something that we can do a little something else with. Exactly. So that's how you came up with pillow pets. Unbelievable. So Jennifer, you had this idea. You just, it was like, okay, the light bulb went off. Maybe this could be something else. Tell us about that moment when you just decided that maybe this can be something that could be the next step that could end up transforming into the pillow pets that you created. Well, you know, I was always trying to invent stuff. Um, and I invented a few uh, products prior. So I realized with this one, I just, I'm like, this is a winner. I, I just, I have to follow this one through. So I went to a wholesale show up in Las Vegas with a friend of mine. And I knew the first step was to find a um, plush manufacturer. So that's what I did. Well, you're saying that you had prior inventions. Uh yeah. Did that cut like you had enough kind of ones that didn't necessarily make it to know that this was the one? What was the difference that you felt between the ones that you did and this one? You know, there was a few that I um, came up with that once I made a prototype and I'm like, ah, I didn't love it anymore. <laughs> I was like, I don't think I would use that. Um, and then I did have another invention that actually I learned my lesson. Um, a large company that I can't name actually ended up taking my invention after I pitched it to them and they, they ended up making it without me. You felt like this was the one. And when you came up with the idea right away, you knew that you had the steps that you needed to take. So you were looking for a plush manufacturer before we get into the details of how you really developed this whole product line and, and product itself. Maybe you could show us a quick demo because sure. the listeners and the, the viewers out there, let them yeah. see what Pillow Pets is about. Well, actually I'll show you the very first one. So the first one we designed was our snuggly puppy. And as you can see, it's a cute stuffed animal. What's really nice is when you flip it on its back, we added the strap right here. And if you undo it, now it flattens it out, like what my son did to his stuffed animal, <laughs> and it turns into a full-size uh, pillow. So it's also a great travel pillow, too. Take it on an airplane, long car rides, uh, and they're also washable. Wow. It looks like you have, I don't know, hundreds behind you. How many different yeah. my pillow pets pillow pets do you have developed? Um I've been told recently that we're up in the, like we've made thousands because we've done sports teams. We've done our own line. We've done a lot of licensing with Disney, Nickelodeon. So um, upward over a thousand different styles. Thousand different styles. And yeah. how long have you been doing this for? Since 2003. Wow. Yeah. And how many would you say pillow pets have you sold worldwide in, um, in all these years? Up to date, I've been told that we've sold over 100 million units. So, yeah. Yeah. We've wow. Sold pillow pets. <laughs> do you, do you, uh, what is, what's that feeling like? Uh, it's surreal. You know, I remember the first time when we finally got into mass retail and it was during the holidays and I walked into Bed Bath and & Beyond and there was a whole end cap 
as high as, you know, all the way up 12 feet high of just pillow pets. And I remember I took a picture in front of that display, like, wow, my creation is in this store. That was very wow. surreal. Yeah. I, I'm not looking to count your uh, revenue or your, or your profit. The average pillow pet goes for what, about $20? Um, actually at the time when we launched it, they were 20 and we're currently at $30, 31 99 actually. So you've sold over a billion dollars of pillow pets. Wow. That's quick did you, math. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> now let's figure out how much you make. No, I'm only kidding. It's uh, over a billion dollars in sales. Wow. Congratulations, Jennifer. That is unbelievable. Thank you. And you did this by yourself or do you have a team? Yeah, I mean, we have a team. Um, my husband and I work together, and uh, but I, I'm part of the design process. I create every pillow pet, and yeah. And does your son feel like he owns the company since he was the one that slept on that pillow on, the, <laughs> on that stuffed he has animal? Demanded royalties. No. <laughs> <laughs> and you have one. You have one son. No, I have two boys, um, and it's funny because when my youngest son was two. I already knew he was going to be an entrepreneur. So he's just started, to, he's going down that path now. Very which is nice. Kind of fun to watch. Uh, now, you mentioned that you have, and I'm looking behind, I see Tigger, I see Clifford. Is that Clifford the big red dog? Yes. Yeah. Um, Care Bear. Is that a Care Bear? No, we have Trolls. Trolls. Um, um, Secret Life. Oh, point over there. Secret Life of Pets. That's, uh, that's from Toy Story. Oh gosh, I'm getting confused uh -huh. here. Toy Story over here. Yeah, we do, like I said, Nickelodeon, Universal, um, Toothless from How to Train Your Dragon. Um, and then we have new licenses we're working on for next year. So when you come up with this idea, you have your own designs that you really want to start with um, before you can go to uh, a licensor that has those property, brand properties like Disney and, and Nickelodeon and those types. So when yeah. you first came up with this idea, the first thing you did was you were looking for that manufacturer, that plush manufacturer. Were you looking in the US? Were you looking overseas? It seems like you had some experience kind of sourcing. Maybe you can tell us how you actually found the factory. So yes, we did have a little bit of experience um, with importing other you know products that we would find. Um, like I said, I come from a family of entrepreneurs, so I've been a salesman since I was 12 years old. Not because I had to, but because I love just working. So um, I kind of knew what you know how to find a manufacturer, and yeah, so found a uh, plush manufacturer. What I liked about this particular manufacturer was the quality of plush that they made. Um, and that's, we built a relationship and ordered our first container. <laughs> when you went to them, did you already know the designs that you were going to use? No, I didn't. Um, I kind of figured a puppy would be a no brainer. Um, but they helped me because they were already making plush for other companies. So they helped me come up with the first six uh, by saying, well, you know, the duck is popular, a cow. Um, so there was, you know, like a farm animal to cow. So, um, yeah, so they definitely helped me with the first six characters. Before you started to even work on those designs to, to almost verify that this idea could be something, mm -hmm. did you really get anybody else's opinion or did you just say, you know what, I'm just going for it. I don't care what anyone says. I hear the six designs. I got the factory. Tell us about that kind of balance between thinking about it and moving forward at that point? Um, I was a gut feeling because I'd been in sales, I mean, since, since a very young age, and I knew I could create a pitch out of this. That's what we called it in the as seen on TV world. Um, I knew this was a pitchable product. So, um, you know, like how I just showed you. Um, and at the end of the day, I was a salesman, my husband was a salesman, and we that we figured we would just take the risk because we could sell it ourselves and, and see what happens. And we were willing to risk buying 5,000 units in one ocean container. When you had the design now uh, to figure out the size, how the, the duck and the dog were going to look, how did that experience go? 
was there some trial and error there to figure out till you got it perfect or, or you pretty much got it? I mean, we pretty much got it. We did um, play around with making round ones, but then we realized it would probably be better to look like an actual pillow because that was going to be part of our pitch. You know, it opens up to a full size pillow. So um, yeah, so pretty much right away, we knew that we wanted to do a rectangular shape head. And did the thought come to mind about intellectual property protecting your idea with a, a, a patent, patent pending with a provisional patent application, design patent, any, wh where did you go with that? So we didn't do that right away because, you know, at the time, I think it was like we got quoted $5,000. So we did think about it, but we didn't really have the money to spend. And we thought, well, let's see if we sell this first. We knew we wouldn't really be on the radar because we only brought in one container. And so once we knew after the first year of sales, that's when we really started um, getting copyrights on our designs, applying for the trademark pillow pets. And yeah. The name pillow pets is very simple, easy to remember. I'm sure now if people weren't sure that they knew what pillow pets were and they looked behind you and they saw that demo, <laughs> I'm sure they know. It's almost like a nostalgic brand because my daughter is 19 and she knows of pillow pets and I knew of pillow pets. So I'm sure that the generations now that are kind of turning over, they hopefully are going to continue to show their kids the pillow pets and you're keeping it in front of them because you're very active, continuing to sell hundreds and thousands of, of designs. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing now uh, is a lot of the kids that it grew up with a pillow pet, um, they're now buying pillow pets for their kids. And that's really just, it kind of touches my heart because it's just so neat that they're going to pass down what they grew up loving, you know, to their children. So it's like me buying a Barbie doll for my niece. I don't have a daughter. A <laughs> <laughs> hundred million units worldwide, over a billion dollars in sales from pillow pets. How did yeah. you come up with the name? So actually, after going to that trade show in Las Vegas, and we found a plush manufacturer on the flight home, which is a short one hour flight, um, that's when I came up with the name. I knew I wanted something descriptive that you could you know, visualize a pillow pet. What's a pillow pet? So it kind of describes the product. And did you get your son's approval before you, before you uh, <laughs> named it? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> you found the factory. You carved out and, and sketched out those designs. You started the production. You mentioned you filled the container. Uh, and this was in China that you ended up uh, manufacturing? Yes. And we still do. Yes. Okay. And this was in 2003. So how difficult was it? I mean, you went to the trade show. Was there any, anything else that you were doing to figure out what the right factory was? No, I mean, we were pretty naive at the time, you know, mm -hmm. we just figured they had a, a nice booth. They had beautiful plush. Um, we met with them. We really connected with them and we just went off of that feeling. Um, yeah. So we didn't really do any due diligence, nothing, to be honest. <laughs> and you had this container of the original six pillow pets that you were doing. Yes. How did you end up figuring out what what your distribution was how did you sell the first bat and how many was the container how many fit in in for your first order i believe it was 5500 units and we put that on a credit card um so my background selling as seen on tv products we did a lot of um you know fairs across the country home shows festivals and that's where we primarily started we knew which shows were the best ones in the country and that's where we booked them and yeah, that's where we first uh, launched the retail. The first round then, you were showing buyers and, and people in, in the fair uh, and the trade show. Did you have any consumer response beforehand? Did you sell anything direct to consumer first to gauge the market? Well, that was our direct to consumer. So oh. I was working the actual you know booth at the fair. I was working in... You know, Eventually, we did a kiosk, a mall kiosk program. Um, so it was great because I was on the floor selling to the consumer myself. And then I would hear, you know, do you have an elephant? Do you have, you know, a ladybug? Um, so we, when you hear it enough, I'd be like, okay, now I know we have to make an elephant next. So that would be my next 
character. And then so they do you have a hedgehog? Do you have, you know, a bear? Um, so that's that's how we basically grew the line was listening to the consumer and what they kept asking for. And then you started to go to the trade shows or you continue to go to the trade shows mm -hmm. and then you were getting larger orders. So when you yeah. were bringing it to the buyers, what was their response? You already had some traction with success direct to consumer. Yes. What was that transition like? So what happened was actually I put on the tag of our animal because back then it wasn't as popular to put your website address and people started contacting us and saying, we'd like to buy wholesale. And at the time we, you know, booked our own booth and we were selling retail ourselves. So um, I looked at my husband, I said, I'm getting, you know, every day somebody's asking if they can buy from us. They want to book their own booth or their own kiosk. And um, so we took the leap of faith and we, um, we ended up wholesale, getting in the wholesale side uh, because of that. So, yeah. <laughs> Was it, it, it seems so easy so far. Uh, just building up all these different designs and, and did that it, to be able to build a brand and a line of all these different designs uh, was risk. And you were putting risk on top of risk, just adding more skews to what you had. What was that like? What was the, was it, I'm just going to continue to go for it. Was there some challenges along the way that kind of helped you help you to make those decisions? Oh yeah. I mean, every entrepreneur has a challenge. Um, yeah, definitely. Not every SKU was, you know, selling like hotcakes. Um, but I got better and better at it and I, I, I'm more selective. I only release a handful of new SKUs a year now. I, there was one year, which was a challenge that we released. I believe it was about a hundred new SKUs and it was the advice of someone that we had hired. And, um, so that was a challenge. I, I definitely learned a big lesson over developing. And you had an outlet for the ones that weren't selling. Oh yeah. We liquidated the ones that weren't selling. That's for sure. Yeah. But the ones behind me, these are all good sellers. <laughs> well, you're, you're kind of in a way, like you went direct to consumer, then you went to the trade shows and, and met with the buyers and started selling wholesale. Yeah. For what was going on in 2003, and I guess a little bit after that, compared to now, for the inventors, the entrepreneurs, the inspirational people out there that have an idea and they're just thinking about it, or they've come up with an idea at some point, yeah. like how how much easier is it these days compared to what it was when you first started? I mean, if you're comfortable with going online. I feel it's a lot easier. You can reach so many more people so much faster, you know, between YouTube and, and now it's TikTok is the biggest one for at least for our company. Um, so, you know, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, it's, it's amazing how many people you can reach in one day where before we were reaching a couple hundred thousand people a day at a trade show or at a fair. Um, now you can reach that easily within minutes. <laughs> Can you just give us a, a quick demo again? Let's sure. see. Let's Here, see another one. The pillow. This time. So you have our, your plush and then, you know, you can cuddle snug, you know, all kids love the comfort of something soft. Um, flip it on its backside. There's a Velcro strap here and it opens up to a full size pillow made of chenille. We've even put a little cover over the Velcro to prevent it from scratching you when you're snuggling it and sleeping with it at night. But and it's a great travel pill. I've traveled all the way to Asia with one. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling uh, one of my friends that I was going to do an interview with you. And uh, he said, oh, I had the ladybug. So oh. I'm going to tell him that uh, you showed the ladybug tonight. <laughs> yeah, back in 2000 and probably 2008, 2010, she was our number one selling pillow. It's, a, it's a, That's been fun over the years to see which ones kind of trend. Yeah. Very interesting. I'm sure I'm going to bring back some memories for him too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he wants me to know that or anybody else to know that, but it's okay. He had a ladybug. <laughs> <laughs> now, as you were expanding, you had the six and you, somebody wanted the elephant, the hedgehog, all these different um, designs and characters. You yeah. really stuck to the pets. You didn't, kind of veer away from that or have you ever thought about moving away from pets 
We did. Um, I've made sweatshirts, I've made purses, backpacks, slippers, um, and they did okay. But at the end of the day, um, for the volume that we like to make and manufacture, um, at the end of the day, this is what drives a company. So we kind of went full circle and now we're concentrating just on the folding pillow. Um, we also have our sleep time lights, which is a pillow pet. Here, I'll show you one. What am I gonna grab? Here's Mickey Mouse. Let's see. So this one here actually lights up. This is our sleep time light. So this is our main line now, are the sleep time lights, pillow pets. And then we are talking about bringing back our glow pets, which is a pillow pet that lights up when you squeeze it, when you snuggle it. Very nice. As you were building, you decided to get Nickelodeon and Disney and it looks like all these different characters. What was the point? Because, you know, you have inventors, let's say they come up with uh, with with a, a really cool can opener and they say this can opener, Budweiser is definitely going to want this can opener. Mm -hmm. And they call up Budweiser and they say, hey, I got this great can opener. You want it? And yeah. Budweiser is like, hey, I make beer. We don't make can openers. So yeah. a lot of inventors out there picture their invention with a brand name on it. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can just explain to us your experience with getting into brand property licensing. Now you're the licensee yeah. and, and the brand is the licensor. So maybe you can explain that to us. So when we first tried to get um, the license for Disney, for example, we weren't as well known. It was the first year we went on TV and they actually said no. Um, they weren't taking any more plush licensors. So we um, then we became more popular on TV. And with the volume that we did, we became more of a household brand name, I guess you can say. Um, and then they changed their mind. So it wasn't easy at first. But once we got Disney, it was a lot easier to get all the others, to be honest with you. Because now you can go in there and that kind of gives you a little ammo. <laughs> right. And you had to match their criteria of what they needed. So... Yeah. Uh, every time one of them sells, you have to pay them a royalty. Correct. Yeah. Very interesting. You mentioned that you were active on, uh, in as seen on TV in that space and in that world. Um, what did you end up doing? And was that your vision from the start to say, you know what, this, this definitely needs to be on as seen on TV? Um, not at the beginning, but I did have a friend who had visited our warehouse and he, and he just got done shooting his commercial. And he said, Jennifer, have you thought about putting this on TV? And I thought, I don't know, because people like to touch and feel, and this is, that's part of the pitch is here. You put it in their hands. And then once they touch it, they're like, Oh, wow. Um, and then I thought, you know what, let's just take the risk. So I called a few of the DRTV um, people that I know and told them how many we had sold. We'd sold half a million units before we even went on TV. So they were surprised at that. They were like, oh, that kind of shows that people like your product. Um, and that's so, that's where we took the chance. Very yeah. interesting. You've done TV, you've done direct to consumer, you've done trade shows to get into retail, social media on your own website, selling. What, what do you suggest for an inventor that's starting off really to test the water uh, if they were going to turn it into their own business and manufacture it and start distribution. What, what have you seen and what do you think is the best way for them? Oh, the best way. I mean, whenever I see a new product invention, the first thing I ask is how much? <laughs> so make sure you can make the product at a price that the consumer is willing to pay for it. Um, definitely. Gosh, you have to find a manufacturer. So nowadays, you know, I'm assuming that you can, you know, go on Alibaba or you can go, you know, um, on different sites, you know, via internet and find a manufacturer. Probably going to have to go and visit that manufacturer nowadays. Um, I'm not even sure. Do they even have wholesale shows here anymore? I don't know after COVID and everything that's going on. But, um, yeah, so you just have to find a good manufacturer. And make sure that they, you know, they have the, all the standards that everybody's looking for and safety testing and, and all that. Yeah. 
Right. And people don't even realize all the behind the scenes that it takes to end up getting the product. Even, I mean, it, yours is not that complicated. Maybe no. it is, but it looks like it would be easy. So tell us what kind of challenges you had along the way. It seemed like everything kind of was in place for you. I know that you had some experience as an inventor before this, but what what really goes on behind the scenes that you're pulling your hair out? Oh, I mean, for one was money. <laughs> you know, I remember going to my bookkeeper and saying, Debbie, I need $50,000 by Friday and today's Tuesday. You know, like, so, I mean, you have to be smart with your money, where you're spending it. Um, another complication we had, because like what you just said, it is a pretty simple product um, that we had a problem with knockoffs. So what we had to do is register, we have copyrights on all of our designs. And like I said, we own the trademark pillow pets. So we went to um, the, um, oh my, I'm losing, uh, mm-hmm. not importers, but the, um, oh no, I lost my, <laughs> my thought you, there. Was it a trade show or was it one of the uh, expos? No, we went to, we actually had to file with um, immigration. And okay. with that, the import, you know, where everything comes in, the ports like in Long Beach or Seattle. And so we um, filed with them and we actually had to stop knockoffs from getting into the country. So that was a big, we that was a big problem, well, especially oh. after the second year being on TV, um, because, I mean, you can knock this off pretty easy. Right. Okay. So you you could spend your time and energy battling against the knockoffs but yeah. you want to keep moving forward what what was it that kind of turned the corner for you to just keep going um i just had faith i wanted a brand i wanted something you know be, coming from the as seen on tv world a lot of products would come and go within six months six to nine months i wanted something that would be around like barbie doll or cabbage patch dolls i wanted something that would stick and so it was worth fighting for when you first started, did you think you were going to sell over a billion dollars of pillow pets? It's Absolutely. okay if you did, but I mean, what what was your expectations in the beginning? No. And in fact, at the beginning, I wrote a check to myself. I just wanted to basically put food on the table for my family. That's all I wanted to do. And having that entrepreneurial spirit at the same time, you know, be able to fulfill my creativity. So, um, no, I didn't have that expect no expectation. Mm-hmm. It, it, Definitely um, blew that out of the water. I just wanted to live comfortably. <laughs> and, and, <I> do. <laughs> and the next steps now, you showed a, a few new lines that are going to be coming out. Are those launching or are they already launched? Yeah, it's, it's ironic because I mentioned TikTok. And in 2016, we had a line of scented pillow pets. And we actually shot a TV commercial and it didn't do good enough to keep on TV. We'll just say, put it that way. And then a girl found one, our strawberry cow, and she did a video and it went viral. Wow. And like I said, I always listen to the consumer. So through social media, all of a sudden people kept asking us for the strawberry cow. So wow. we're really um, focused on our scented line because that's been really uh, good for our company the last few years. That's awesome. There's inventors, entrepreneurs, people out there that had an idea back in the day and now they are looking for their next idea. If you can just give us some final words of wisdom to the inventors, entrepreneurs, anybody listening or watching, give us some some advice, Jennifer, to keep us moving forward and, and to hopefully have the success that you've had. A hundred million units, over a billion dollars. Give yeah. us some words of wisdom. You know, um, Being an entrepreneur, yes, we do it for the money, I guess, you know, because you want to put food on the table. But at the end of the day, it has to be your passion. So being an entrepreneur is like riding on a roller coaster. You're going to go up and down hills. You're going to go through turns. You're going to be sideswiped. And you're going to sometimes you're going to have to make fast decisions. And as long as you're passionate and true to your product and true to the people around you, um, just keep on trudging through. Amazing. Jennifer Telfler, congratulations, creator of Pillow Pets. Thank you very much for being a guest on our show. Thanks for having me, Brian. Thank you, Jennifer. And if you would like to be a guest on the Got Invention Show, go to gotinventionshow.com. Thank you. And until then, keep on inventing. <music>